Welcome to the next episode of Endoscopy Essentials. Today we are dealing with serious business. We talk about the evidence of a specific new technique, which is bile duct access and bile duct drainage by endoscopic ultrasound as compared to the classical ERCP access. And a warm welcome to Amrita Sethi from New York. Thank you. Amrita, you are one of the experts to do both procedures and also to talk about those studies. Thank you. So maybe as an introduction, we look at the studies and the data, etc. So uh, the first slide shows the first multicenter study. Yep. This is the um, Drambo study by um, Anthony Teo as the lead author, and it's looking at EUS guided cholecoaduodenostomy using LAMS versus standard ERCP uh, with covered metal stents for um, unresectable malignant biliary distal biliary obstruction. So, if you don't pronounce it sharply, it sounds like Rambo, <laughs> but it's Drambo. Yes. I don't know that I've ever heard any of the authors actually say the name, so I'm, yeah, I'm they're avoiding <laughs> maybe making it up. So let's look at the, at the second slide. Um, 10 centers, 49 months, 165 cases. Yeah. So, you know, one, one of the things about studies like these is when you have multiple centers is really understanding how many people are doing these procedures, how many cases are actually coming from each center, um, are there any issues around um, consistency in the way that the procedure is done and the instruments that are being used. I think it's been an issue for prior studies looking at this question, which have had indeterminate results because there's a lot of variability. And But to a certain extent, we also can't avoid it, right, because these are newer procedures and the, um, it's probably harder to recruit uh, into this, a study like this. So we have to find a balance between multiple centers, how many centers, and um, getting enough patients to power a study. Right. I mean, if we do simple maths and assuming, which was probably not the case, that all centers recruited during the entire study period it's four cases per center in a year, which yeah. uh, is probably only a very small fraction of eligible cases. Um, yeah. Yes, it, it's definitely a limitation. Um, I think what's important, and they, you know, it, the study uh, details well, is that it's a very standardized procedure, and the types of stent was very standardized. It's a, a lambs, a specific, only one type of lambs, and even the size, there was little variability, I think, in the size of the stents that were used. So to some degree, there's consistency. On the other hand, I mean, we all know you do a multi-center study and uh, many centers are not sending CRF, so you call them and say, ah, the study, <laughs> and the next patient will go into the study. But that, that's maybe one of the limitations of a randomized study, right? Yeah, absolutely. But let's look at, back to the slide, let's look at the results. 76% ERCP. For Would you be happy if, with these figures from, if, if they were from your center? No, I think that's less than standard for you know, technical success of ERCP. I think the, the issue here is that it is um, distal you know, um, biliary obstruction, and oftentimes that is the problem with the success those are the cases that are unsuccessful in ERCP. So we've always looked at EUS guided ERCP as a salvage. And so I think this study and studies like this are specifically asking if we don't consider it a salvage, but we consider it from the beginning, you know, is there a role to do that? So in this situation, I, I believe that this study did not exclude patients who may potentially have gastric outlet obstruction or inability to access. So Amrita, um, technical success. Let's go back to the slide. 76.3%, the second is always the RCP. If it came from your center, wouldn't you look into quality control and stuff? Yes, I mean, it definitely um, is lower than what we would typically think of success rates for all ERCPs. Now, 
I think something to keep in mind is that this is very specifically distal, malignant um, distal biliary obstruction. And I believe in this study, they did not exclude the potential for gastric outlet obstruction or inability to access the, the papilla. So, you know, this is a little bit more real time when you're specifically talking about distal biliary obstruction. So I, th I think some of the, failure, the technical failures for the ERCP group were those in which they could not dilate or um, get through duodenal strictures caused by um, malignant obstruction. So not compared to our normal practice, but maybe when we're very specifically looking at this question. So you can say it's a fair or it's an unfair comparison, depending on you know what you look at. Um, yeah. But we, we, we said that it's a, perhaps a pre-selection of cases anyway, and uh, yeah. Good, and uh, as you can see, one year's stent patency was the same, but I guess that's a per-protocol analysis. That's right. Because intention to treat, you should include the failures of your CP. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't think that's the, that unexpected, um, particularly when we hear about some of the issues related to cholidoco um and what we already know about fully covered metal stents. So I, not terribly surprising. Okay, let's look at the next slide and um, complications. I mean, the assumption before would be that in malignancy there were, was a very low rate of ERCP complications, especially pancreatitis, which we are most afraid of. But, you know, the EOS drainage can have a substantial number and severity of complications. That doesn't seem to be true. That's, that's true. And, you know, again, if we look at um, this is a very well done, careful s study in terms of the centers that were doing them and the experts who were doing these procedures and the devices that were being used. So this very specifically lambs, the size of lambs, and the technique is something that's been practiced by these um, endoscopists who participated in this study. So one could imagine that the typical complications that we hear about with um, a uh, lamb placement, for example, would be less because they've now, they're experienced. But I, and I think that's something to maybe consider when we translate this into general population of endoscopists and where we think this has a role. Right, we'll come to this uh, after the second study. Let's look a, a little bit at uh, some of the complications. I didn't list all of them. Nothing surprising. No, this seems pretty typical of um, both the EUS cases, I think, and, and the ERCP, of course, that, um, I think these are fairly standard numbers. Again, two perforations? Oh, yeah, maybe that one. <laughs> <laughs> that, and I was trying to recall the actual perforation um, was, was a bile duct perforation? The, the only thing which stands out, two perforations in the ERCP group? Yeah, it's hard to really interpret this too much. Um, the paper itself does not detail. Um, it sounds like they are scope-related um, luminal perforations, um, and it's hard to really figure out, unless, unless they're sphincterotomy perforations for some reason, could be related to um, dilating of strictures, which was allowed in this study for the standard ERCP group. But um, so hard to interpret. Okay, let's go to the next slide and the next study. Um, element. Element. Sounds so, a bit better than Rumble. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but similar um, in terms of intent. So EUS uh, guided biliary drainage in, as a first attempt using lambs again versus ERCP with um, actually in this one they don't specify um, a fully covered metal stent or not. Pretty similar. Pretty similar. Number of centers, 11 versus 10. Um, so again, we're Four dealing... Four per year. Four per um, year. So again, technical success, a difference, but not that dramatic. Yeah, not that significant. Um, I, th I believe in this study, um, they did exclude patients with um, overt evidence of gastric outlet obstruction. So that would be, again, selection, a little bit of selection bias for patients that can have technical success with the standardized ERCP, that might be some of the difference that we're seeing in the two studies. Patency at one year, 90%? 
Yeah, and it's interesting because if you look carefully at this study, um, any type of metal stent could be used. So it included uncovered, partially covered, and covered. Um, one might expect that the stent patency rate just in the, the stent group should be lower because of the inclusion of uncovered stents. Um, so hard to, to comment on that too. But survival was not so brilliant huh, in that study. Yeah, so it's interesting the choice of primary outcome was um, stent dysfunction up to one year. And the survival rate, I mean, 66% of the patients died before the one year outcome. So again, um, looking at perhaps maybe a, a, a shorter time period should have been looked at in terms of being able to accurately measure stent dysfunction. Um, I, I always have problems, you know, if you do, if they do these Kaplan-Meier tricks, so the patency is three times as long as the survival, so they survived between 110 and 145 days, and uh, so, I mean, if you put it ironically, you could say a stent is still open while the patient is uh, dead for six months, but uh, <laughs> statisticians ex try to explain this to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have to kind of go on the fact that most likely equal number of patients died um, mm -hmm. within the, the time period on both sides. So perhaps that takes away from that confounding factor. And you know, this, this uh, still applies even though there's a low uh, mortality rate. Okay, finally, uh, complications. Again, no significant differences um, between the short-term adverse event rates, uh, both procedural and I believe delayed. Between the two. Nothing spectacular. Nothing Three quarters special. were cholangitis. So. Yeah. So, Amrita, summarizing, what's the practical uh, conclusion and recommendation? I mean, is, is there really enough evidence with, you know, four cases per year again? Let me argue against a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that yeah. This is converted from a salvage to a primary one. And what about common bile duct diameter? You know, we learned that it must be, I think, 12 or 10 at least uh, millimeters. Uh, that's another selection. I think what this study says is that you, it's not inferior, right? But the conditions have to be correct. Um, the most important is you have to be skilled in mm -hmm. EOS-guided ERCP, specifically cholidocodoadenostomy using LAMS, which is not all of the EUS guided procedures are not equal. So I think that's the most important thing. This is not something for the general interventional endoscopist to jump into as a first line therapy. But if you do it, um, if it's done in the right hands, it can be equally as safe. So it's, it's, it's definitely doable. But the other conditions, the bile duct has to be, you know, big enough. Um, and, um, so I think things like that are very important when we think about this. And I think it sort of brings us back to the sense that, you know, in general, we respect the anatomy when we can, but we anticipate when we anticipate when the scans show us that there is a higher chance of uh, failure with standard ERCP, it is reasonable to perhaps take this as a first line as opposed to trying the ERCP, mm -hmm. failing the ERCP, and then going to this procedure. That's a good point. So a big bile duct, narrow duodenum, consider US drainage first. Yeah. Standard situation, what would you do? I would always try, if everything's okay, I would first try um, standard ERCP. I'm a bit of a romantic when it comes to <laughs> um, this field and procedures and development of these procedures and, and that concept of not necessarily creating new fistulas. I think we still need more data to see whether or not there's long-term differences in survival, um, particularly with newer you know, treatment regimens coming out um, between not going through a tumor versus um, uh, putting a stent through a tumor. Also, the oncologic circumstances should be taken into account. Uh, I spoke to a few surgeons when you have a uh, a metal stent uh, in, in the bulb, can the pylora still be preserved? Because uh, some of those cases get new adjuvant therapy and maybe there is secondary surgery. Uh, there's a word of caution or not? I mean... 
I, I think with just the like US approach. yeah, I think just like EUS guided gallbladder drainage, we need more data and experience from teams like those that performed this study. And I think that's the other important thing is, um, you know, the the primary teams that supported these are teams of surgeons and and um, GIs who do endoscopic um, uh, interventional endoscopic procedures. I think in the study in in Teo's study, the patients that did go to surgery. Um, uh, there was no difference in the surgical outcomes in those that had the, the cholidoco duodenostomy. But I think we need more data. Yeah, I think so. We would like to ask the authors to specifically report on those patients with secondary surgery, what type of surgery was, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. But your conclusion is the majority under normal conditions try ERCP first, maybe go to US in the same session if you fail. It's another yeah, yes, question. I think yeah. I think there is a, a reasonable argument to be made that we sh we should definitely do that. Um, we should consent patients from the beginning um, and have a perhaps a lower threshold. So I think they gave 15 minutes and Teo said 15 mm -hmm. minutes of failed uh, failure with standard cannulation, then moving to a secondary method for 15 minutes. In the second study, it was 15 minutes overall. Um, perhaps we have a lower threshold to move to the U.S. guided. And as we said, narrow duodenum, big bile duct, then consider primary yeah. U.S. I hope we don't get beaten up by the authors <laughs> for this uh, romantic, uh, still ERCP having a role approach. But, no, I uh, think these are really important yes. studies. Yes. I think they're very yes. important studies. Um, they've definitely established safety. Um, and. Uh, you know, the, the shortened time period is important to know, um, if particularly if patients are sick and um, or if you have other demands that um, require that they take a um, shorter amount of time. I think the other pending question is that of cost and more importantly, what impact it can have in, with industry in terms of being able to supply these um, devices now that we know are safe and may have increased increased efficacy, but making it so that it's cost effective as well. Okay, and again, at the end, it's a method for centers. Yes. So it's something like kids don't do this at home type right. of thing. Uh, that's also yeah, uh, and, important and we to should remember. work on training yeah. for the procedures and make sure that the procedures themselves are standardized, um, so that we don't have uh, too much variability in the way we practice them. Okay, I think that was a very good roundup. Thank you very much, Amrita. You're and I hope we can have you back soon for other data, other studies. We'd love to. Thank you.